If, uh, if you have your Bible, turn your Bible to the New Testament. And when you've found the New Testament, find the Gospel of John. And when you found the Gospel of John, find the 8th chapter. That's where, we're gonna, that's where we are going to spend most of the day today. In the Gospel of John, in the 8th chapter. Read along. I'll read it and uh, read with me. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. And he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn thee? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, from now on, sin no more. You know, if anyone knew about the law, it was the scribes and the Pharisees. And the Old Testament is very clear about the penalty for adultery. In Deuteronomy 22:22, 22, 22, if a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die. Leviticus 20:10, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The law was clear to the scribes and the Pharisees. But Jesus knew a little something about the law as well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, as we come before your throne, that you will open our hearts and our minds to understand the message that you have for us. Father God, we thank you for the word, your word, the word that stands in eternity. And so we pray that you would illuminate it to us. We pray that we might keep the world outside these walls for the next 10 or 15 minutes. And then, Lord, when we leave this place, let us be able to say, it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's something about coming face to face with something or, or anything. In America, we like our space, don't we? And if something gets too close, well, sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable for us. And if a person comes face to face with us, well, we had better know them pretty well. And as we've read about Jesus in the New Testament, we have seen him in a hundred different situations. He's been face to face with people that are in a need, face to face with demons, face to face with his disciples, even face to face with the dead. And now in this passage, we read that Jesus comes face to face with a sinner. John chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Um, the beginning of chapter 8 is really the end of chapter 7. In the end of chapter 7, Jesus was talking with some of the chief priests. And the last verse in chapter 7 says, And they all went to their house. The beginning of chapter 8 but Jesus went to Mount of Olives. Jesus did not have a house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. You know, we can see that even though the scribes and the Pharisees did not like Jesus, it was still the practice of Jesus to come into the temple to teach. And the people knew that. And the people made their way to wherever Jesus was. They were hungry to learn what Jesus had for them. And isn't it surprising that here today, 
We've come, learn, we've come here to learn something from Jesus. Seems to me nothing has changed in 2,000 years. And Jesus preached the gospel of salvation. And the gospel about salvation starts that God created the heavens and the earth, everything above us, everything below us. God created it. And then God created us. And we are his best thing. If God carried a wallet, he'd have your picture in it. God created the heavens and the earth, and yet we are his best thing. And yet, James, the New Testament book of James, tells us that there's sin in this world. If we know the right thing to do, and we do not do it, to them that is sin. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah says that our sins separate us from God. You see, God did not walk away from us. We walked away from God because of the sin in our lives. And yet here's the paradox of God's love. He loves us anyways. He loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And when we believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God who died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and that God raised him from the dead... Well, Romans 10:13 says, He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible is an exciting place if we have a heart to listen. Amen? Amen. Say it like you mean it. Amen. It's an exciting place to be. So Jesus is in the temple. He's teaching the people that wanted to come and learn from him. John chapter 8, verses 3 through 6. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court... They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. You know, knowing that Jesus had a schedule to be in the temple, the scribes and the Pharisees, they came up with a plan to accuse him. And their hope was to put Jesus in a position that he had to choose one of two answers. And no matter what Jesus chose, they had an opportunity to bring a charge against him. You see, the Romans did not have the penalty of death for adultery. And so if Jesus said, yeah, go ahead and stone her, then they could bring a charge against Jesus to the Roman governor. And if Jesus said, then no, you will not stone her, then the scribes and the Pharisees could tell the people, see, he doesn't follow the law of Moses. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? The plans of men are feeble at best when they are set against God, and Jesus did not respond to them at all. Jim, Jesus simply bent down. And with his finger, wrote in the ground. John, verses 7 and 8. But when they persisted in asking, he straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, the Pharisees were looking for one of two answers. They never thought, they never thought that there might be a third response to their question. And so we read this passage, and we know, of course, we do not know what Jesus wrote on the ground. We want to know, but we don't know what he wrote. We can make guesses. We can try to deduce. We can assume what we think he may have written. But the fact is, we don't know. And this is another case that we allow the Bible to speak for itself. And if the Bible does not say it, we cannot read anything into it. And notice this, that before or after this event, the Bible does not record Jesus writing anything before or after this event. And notice how different Jesus is. Jesus writes in the sand. And mankind, 
Mankind, we carve our words in stone because we want them to last forever. And notice that when Jesus did write, he wrote to avoid condemning a sinner. And there were probably only a few select men that could actually see what he had written. And whatever we might say about his writing, we can agree that if it was Jesus, it was direct. It was to the point of those who had seen it. Jesus had just said to these accusers, he who is without sin among you cast the first stone at her. John chapter 8, verse 9. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. The first thing that men would naturally do would be to look and see what Jesus was writing. But it was not what Jesus had written that sent these men out. Look at that passage. And when they heard it, they began to go out. And this is not to say that what they read did not have an um, impact on them. But it was the spoken word of Jesus Christ that sent them away. From the older to the younger, from the most honored, the most respected, to the youngest apprentice. And now Jesus is left alone with this woman in the middle of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on, sin no more. Jesus came face to face with the sinner by the testimony of others. And by the fact that she did not deny it, there's no doubt that this woman was a sinner. And so now it's Jesus and the woman who are in the middle of the court, surrounded by the men and women who have come to learn from Jesus The people who came to Jesus back then came for the same reason that we came today. So we can learn from Jesus' example what we are to do when we come face to face with a sinner. See, I read this passage and I'm not sure the point of this passage was to teach about the dangers of adultery, although Jesus called it sin. So what is the lesson for us in this passage First of all, we can learn from Jesus' example that Jesus does not run away when he comes face to face with a sinner, nor should he. And notice that Jesus does not stand on a chair and point and shout, there's a sinner. Christ is confident when he stands before a sinner, a sinner like us, because he is that loving Savior You know, Jesus was not sent for perfect people. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus said, I did not come for the righteous, but for the sinners. Do we see that Jesus is comfortable being face to face with a sinner? And his grace toward that woman that day. It's the same grace that he shows us. It's the same grace that we should show others when we come face to face with a sinner. And notice, too, that Jesus does not shy away from calling our sin, sin. But neither does he condemn us. It is the Christian where the Holy Spirit indwells us. It stirs our conscience to do things right. So that when we do not do the right thing, we are reminded of our sin by the Holy Spirit. And that judgment that will come to us comes only, only after we have left this body behind and our eternal spirit stands before God the Father. And if we've called upon the name of Jesus, if we believe that He is the Son of God, if we have faith that God raised Him from the dead, when we stand before God, We will have the Son of God as our advocate, our lawyer, and what 
Peter calls the guardian of our soul standing next to us. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is not our accuser. He is our defender. And if I was a sinner, and I am, I would rather have Jesus defend me than accuse me. You see, it's Jesus alone that can look into the face of a sinner and then turn in a moment, go face to face with God the Father on our behalf. That's my Savior. That's your Savior. Amen? Amen. And we have seen Jesus go face to face with sin and see how he reacts. So naturally, the question comes to us, how should we react when we come face to face with sin? How should we react when we come face to face with a sinner? And I read this, and I think that his example is our command. You know, the world today, they, looks at a, they look at a Christian, and they stand defiantly in their sin face to face, and they say, what do you think about that? And our reaction to coming face to face with a sinner defines the maturity we we have in Jesus Christ. Do we scream and run away? Do we ignore it? Do we throw our bad looks at this person in judgment? Because Jesus didn't do any of those things. If anything... Jesus scolded those men who accused and condemned this woman. And since the Son of God did not condemn the sinner, maybe it's not our place to do so. You see, the Bible talks about a righteous judge. But it's not you. And it is certainly not me. Should we then judge them and condemn the sin? Should we not say anything at all because we're afraid we might offend them? You know, as righteous as we might think we are, to accuse and condemn would sound like accused and condemned. Or should we call the sin, sin, and not judge and not condemn? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He calls sin exactly what sin is so that's what we're supposed to do when we come face to face with a sinner call the sin exactly what it is it's sin and then quote jesus look around and say where are those people who condemn you neither do i condemn thee you see jesus knew that it wasn't the woman who was on trial he was And it seems the same thing happens today. It is the Christian who is on trial, not the sin, not the sinner. And the world, the world steps back because they want to see how a Christian reacts face to face with a sinner. And we know that there are self-righteous people who look to get their point across no matter the harm, no matter the cost to the other person. But that self-righteous person should never, never be us. We know those people are out there. The self-righteous people are the ones who accuse, and they're the same ones who condemn. But Jesus, the righteous judge, did not accuse or condemn. Oh, that we could learn that lesson from his example. You know, we're looking at sin today not to determine the way we look at our own sin. We're looking at sin in order to examine the way we deal with everybody else's sin. For some reason, the world loves to take a sinner and put them up in front of everyone in public. They accuse and they condemn. How else could they get everyone's attention away from their own sin. You see, there's a difference between acting religiously and acting righteously. And Jesus, he did not act religiously. And by the way, religiously or righteously is not acting holy. Being righteous is simply doing the right thing. 
And the most righteous thing that Jesus shows us is the loving acceptance of those who have trouble doing what is right. Mother Teresa said, if we have time to judge a person, we don't have time to love that person. Too often the religious person is dressed in anger and rage as if we have offended them. When we come face to face with a sinner, are we being religious or are we being righteous? Because the Bible is filled with those people who are unacceptable to society. They are troubled, they are sick, they are weak. Jesus spent time with thieves and liars for crying out loud. Look, look how much time he spends with us. And Jesus took some time with this woman caught in adultery. You see, people's sin do not stop him from being who he is. And who is he? He's our example. And I want to make sure that we understand that there is a place for the accountability of our sin. It's just that there's no place for condemning someone else if we haven't dealt with our own sin. See, the problem is simple. There's no reason for stoning another person if we are to be the people that are holy enough to do it. Jesus has gone face to face with a sinner. And the Pharisees' questions of what to do should have been an easy one. If Jesus was religious, he would have condemned her. But Jesus, the righteous, did not. And while we always have to be thinking about our sin and our own sin consuming us, we must guard ourselves from letting us someone else's sin consume us the fact is there's more than enough of our sin to struggle through do we want to do the religious thing or the righteous thing so what's the preacher saying today and for a moment i want to just use your imagination for just a moment imagine that someone has bound your hands together and by force they have brought you before the Lord Jesus. And you're thrown down at his feet and you notice at his feet that someone, someone has written your greatest sin in the sand. Exactly, exactly where Jesus is standing. And as you look up to see his face, you know that he's stooping down toward you. And with his hands... He erases what has been written. And as he stands up, he lifts you up. And he frees your hands and he tells you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is exactly what Jesus Christ has done for you if you are a child of God. And the lesson for us learning what to do when we come face to face with a sinner if we are to learn anything from Jesus' example, it is this. I would rather have a Christian defend me than have a Christian condemn me. God be praised.